The following episode of Let's Talk About Sects was recorded live at Woodford Folk Festival on the 1st of January 2024. The audience was fantastic, especially considering it was New Year's Day and a rather heavy topic. Thanks to Woodford for hosting this presentation. When the talk was originally scheduled and sent by the festival directors, it was initially vetoed, and I put in a plea on behalf of the victim survivors of this group that their stories had a right to be heard, and that it was only right for this discussion to take place at a festival that had hosted the group in question. At this year's festival, answering a question about a supposed misunderstanding with pro-Palestinian activists, the organisers clearly stated that their position is not one of censorship. Whilst what had happened with my talk felt dangerously close to censorship, full credit to the festival for coming around. I believe it's highly important for organisations to interrogate their past transparently, and it's up to the audiences and presenters at this esteemed festival to continue holding them to their word. I hope you enjoy the episode. Could you please put your hands together for Sarah Steele? Welcome to the very first live recording of Let's Talk About Sects, taking place at Woodford Folk Festival and coming to you from the lands of the Jinnabara Nation, whose people Joe and I acknowledge as the traditional custodians and whose elders past and present we pay our respects to. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I want to thank Woodford for having me here today. For a little while there, it didn't look like this episode was going to happen at this festival, and I'm pleased that the directors uh, decided to let it go ahead, and I want to thank the programmers for putting it in. I think it's really important. Um, Joining me today, performing our accompanying music live for the first time in six seasons of this podcast, is Joe Gould. You may recognise Joe from Wood Fortier's past. He's played many a show with his ARIA-nominated group, The Crooked Fiddle Bands. Many people here today would have come across the 12 tribes previously at this very festival. They used to build a big common ground cafe by the lake, and tens of thousands of festival goers ate and drank there over the years. I never saw it, but I have eaten at the Yellow Deli in Katoomba, one of the 12 tribes' many establishments around the world. I want to be clear at the outset, there are many wonderful people who have devoted their lives to the communities and the lifestyle of the 12 tribes. Thousands of fantastic individuals and families are truly dedicated to a way of life that in certain respects has a lot to offer. Their positive experiences, however, don't negate the stories of those who have come out with less positive things to say. And it's incredibly important to understand why there have been numerous corroborated stories with similar themes of harm that have come out of this group over the decades since they formed. At the end of this episode, you can draw your own conclusions as to how you feel about continuing to dine in the cafes and drink the green juices produced by the 12 tribes. For audience members here today, we'll have an extended Q&A session following a short break, and I welcome any questions you may have or any stories you'd like to share about the tribes or about cults in general. So let's take a deep dive into the 12 tribes. Welcome to Let's Talk About Sects, a podcast about cults around the world. I'm your host, Sarah Steele. Before we get into the episode, a content warning. This podcast deals with issues that some people may find disturbing, related to emotional abuse and controlling behaviours. This episode deals with some heavier subjects of stillbirths, physical abuse of children, and homophobia and racism. Please use your discretion as to whether this will be suitable for you and those around you who may be listening to. Albert Eugene Spriggs Jr. was born to Albert Eugene Spriggs Sr. 
and Mabel Louise Wilson on the 18th of May, 1937, in Hamilton County, Tennessee. Albert Eugene Jr. was nicknamed Jean and was brought up in a devout Methodist household. According to a biography on the 12 Tribes website, Jean excelled at football in high school and was popular amongst his peers, being voted May King and securing a football scholarship to study psychology at the University of Tennessee. But it also says that the temptations of youth were causing Jean some conflict, as his partying and drinking lifestyle didn't measure up to the high standards of his religious father. This is supposedly what led him into his first doomed marriage at the age of 19. After graduating college, in 1962, Jean was conscripted into the army before becoming a school guidance counsellor and embarking on his second marriage. Interestingly, the website bi biography includes no mention of the child that came from this marriage, a son named Tyrone. Jean was offered a management job recruiting new workers for his father's longtime employer, carpet manufacturer Dixie Yarns. Again, from the 12 Tribes website biography, quote, the principles that his father had put into Jean still caused him to suffer, and the choices he made in order to fit into the fast lane of the executive lifestyle caused him great inner conflict. His second marriage came to an end. Next came a role in travel as a tour director and a third marriage. When Albert Sr. encouraged Jean to give his life to God as his dying wish, Jean promised his father that he would. But soon enough, his third marriage encountered problems too and Jean figured out the thing to do was get out of town and try his hand at something new. On his way to California, a friend offered him a job running a concession stand at a carnival in Alabama. From the website again, quote, here he faced the human degradation of people who were not cultured enough to hide their wretched condition. Walking down the center of the midway, Jean saw vividly the depths to which mankind had sunk. He looked at all the freaks, the cheating, the immorality, and the mockery rising up on both sides of him, and it broke his heart. Here it seems that Jean heard directly from his creator. Quote, in his distress, he heard a question deep inside his soul. Is this why I created you? It was a very disturbing question. It was not just a personal question, but an earth-shaking question with implications for all mankind. Jean was truly ready now to surrender his life to a higher power at the age of 33. He made it to California after turning his back on the carnival job, and there he encountered the Jesus Movement in full swing. The Jesus Movement was an exciting time in the late 1960s and early 70s, where youth who were uninspired by the traditional structures of mainstream churches found other ways they could connect with God. Slogans at the time included, yes to Jesus, no to the church, an Explo 72 saw 80,000 young people flock to the 1972 Dallas event dubbed Christian Woodstock and attended by the likes of Chris Christopherson and Johnny Cash alongside evangelist Billy Graham. A number of home church-based religious organisations I've looked into for Let's Talk About Sects can trace their roots back to this movement, including the Children of God, Xenos in Ohio, and the Melbourne-based Outreach International. Initially invigorated by the movement, Jean soon came to believe that most people did not have a deep enough conviction in their heart and were just caught up in a fad. He headed out of California for the Rocky Mountains, keen to spread the word of salvation. There he met a young woman named Marsha Ann Duval, who was some 15 years younger than the still married Jean and in her late teens at the time. Jean's rocky third marriage came to an end and Marsha became his fourth and final wife in 1972. Marsha had dropped out of her college philosophy studies and when Jean found her living a simple life in a small village, she didn't have much time for God. Apparently, the loving Jesus that Jean spoke of and his passion for justice appealed to Marsha and she reconsidered her disdain for religion. There's an interesting section in the 12 Tribes website origin story here that made me wonder about the subtext. Quote, even though Jean had a new life and was married to a woman who shared his convictions, he knew that many things from his old life in Tennessee were unresolved and he could not be devoted to the purpose of God, the purpose God had called him to until his conscience was completely clear. In spite of Marsha's lack of desire to, to head south, 
Gene brought his wife back to Chattanooga and the pair got jobs. Gene working as a substitute teacher and Marsha in a restaurant. Quote, soon all the debts were paid and as much as possible, all the wrongs were righted. Like me, you'll have to take a guess at what these wrongs might have been. A quick note here that I'm informed that Jean's biographical details on the 12 Tribes website are highly sanitised and regularly get changed. Jean and Marsha brought their zeal for the Lord back with them and they began, be, began attending a variety of non-denominational church services as well as opening up their home to people who wanted to talk about Christ. Their house became known as The Lighthouse and they began publishing an underground newspaper called The Light Brigade Free Paper which they handed out at concerts and events. The couple let down and out young people stay with them if they had nowhere else to sleep, and they soon found they needed more space to care for the less fortunate. They decided that they should fund a bigger space by running a business. Jean and Marsha opened the first Yellow Deli in May 1973 on Brainerd Road in Chattanooga. The Katoomba Yellow Deli that Australian listeners may be aware of, located in the Blue Mountains a couple of hours out of Sydney, opened in 2004, originally under the name Common Ground. Common Ground stalls selling 12 tribes breads and produce are often seen at markets around the city too, and there used to be a bakery with the name in Roselle in Sydney's inner west. Until very recently, there was also a Common Ground at the Razorback Inn in Picton in Sydney southwest. That very first yellow deli in Chattanooga said on the menu, our specialty is fruit of the spirit, why not ask? Around 1976, Jean and Marsha had a short stint with an organisation called the New Covenant Apostolic Order, or the NCAO, which was the first to declare Jean an apostle, but they soon split ways with him over one of his teachings about absolute obedience, a former follower tells me. The group moved to a bigger house on Vine Street that became known as the Vine House, and the hippie-looking communal living folk stopped attending traditional services and started singing and worshipping in a local park. They called their gatherings critical mass. As the 12 Tribes website says, they stopped going to church and started being the church. They especially followed the book of Acts, which said, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. A copy of the current 12 Tribes free paper called Awakening, which is up on their website, references Mark 8.34, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. An article from a long-term member only referred to as Bob says, What does it mean to deny yourself? It means to live your life for others, serving them. It means hating your life in this world and not living for yourself anymore. It was in response to the group's unconventional approach to living that the tribe's website says that, lies and slanderous rumours began to surface about them. Tim Elliott is a senior writer for The Good Weekend. He's won two Kennedy Awards and is Walkley nominated, with his work appearing in publications all over the world. Tim hosts the podcast Inside the Tribe, which I highly recommend you listen to for more stories of the 12 tribes. He told me about some of the tribe's beliefs. Part of the 12 tribes' belief is that they are raising their religious philosophy, theology, is that they're raising a pure-born breed of 144,000 male children who, during Armageddon, will go out and save the world by waging war on Satan, right? So to raise that army of pure male children, warriors, young warriors, they have to teach them complete obedience and it's up to the tribes to raise that army themselves out of their own, own children. That's why they don't tolerate any answering back, no disobedience at all. So it has really ugly, ugly fallout and side effects for those children. Within the tribes, Jean Spriggs is referred to as Yonek, and his teachings are seen as coming directly from God. Members are given Hebrew names, and the tribes refer to Jesus as Yeshua and God as Yahweh. 
Jean's interpretation of the book of Revelation sees the raising of 144,000 perfect male virgins as a requirement for Yeshua's second coming, with an apocalyptic battle predicted to occur sometime this century. The tribes believe that they're reforming the first century church in line with the book of Acts, and that preceding Yeshua's return is the creation of a new Israel consisting of tribes in 12 different regions around the world. The 144 male virgins will comprise 12,000 from each tribe, and they will all die as martyrs. According to the current 12 tribes awakening free paper, the 12th tribe of the community was finally established in 2006. The way that 12 tribes communities are set up includes multiple families and single people living in homes together. Single men and single women will share separate dorm style rooms with a common kitchen and dining room where everyone gathers for meals together. A grouping of homes will form a cluster or a clan, and one home in the cluster will have a room big enough for all of the community members to gather every morning and evening for worship through song and dance. Clusters across a certain region make up a tribe, and way out houses are their form of missionary work, where a couple of people will go out and try to establish a new community. Although they're not overly pushy, the belief that they'll need to create 144,000 male virgins drives the growth aspirations of the tribes, which form a background to their interactions with the public at cafes and markets. And they also have a bus they call the Peacemaker. By the latter half of the 1980s, 12 tribes members were following the Grateful Dead and Fisher's national touring routes on the Peacemaker, where they set up in concert parking lots and offered help to audience members coming down from bad acid trips. By 2013, an updated Peacemaker was following Bob Dylan's tour. In the communities, after the 6 a.m. morning gathering, everyone will head off to their place of work. Unless they need it for their job, members don't have access to the internet, and unapproved reading materials and television are not permitted, though I understand that Gene Spriggs used to hide a TV set in a closet for his own personal usage, which included a love of college sport and westerns. From sundown Friday to sundown Saturday night is Sabbath, but followers will work the other six days of the week without any break for vacation aside from religious holiday observances. From the tribe's current awakening free paper again, quote, all income from our various endeavors goes into a common purse from which all of our needs are met equitably. We don't have our own independent income or debts to carry by ourselves except for the debt of love we owe to our savior, which we repay by loving and caring for one another. Tim Elliott told me about some of the tribe's businesses and how they operate. So they own bakeries, restaurants, cafes, demolition companies, renovation companies, soap factories, all sorts, every, all sorts of companies around the world, right? And they sell, here in Australia, they sell food at festivals like the Royal Easter Show and the Woodford Folk Festival, and they worked at the Sydney Olympic Games. You know, they can make half a million dollars a week from these, to these festivals, right? Now, the, the tribe's members work at at these festivals, they work at all of the group's companies, and it's grueling. Like, they might work 12 or 15-hour days, and they might they might sleep on the floor of the bakeries in, in some of the cases we found out about. So their work is extremely hard, and they never see a cent, they never get paid anything because they're not classified as workers. What's wrong with volunteering, you may ask? Many people here in this audience today have likely volunteered many hours to make this festival what it is. Former member Matthew Klein, whose story we'll hear a little later, had this to say. I volunteer myself. I'm in the RFS. I volunteer for rock climbing associations as a judge. I do all sorts of volunteer work and it's reasonable. It's, it's my hours and it's, it's, it's not onerous. But there's no way. Like the biggest work day I put in was a 52 hour work day. And that's as a volunteer, and it was dangerous, and that's like you wouldn't do that very often, but it's most most men in that uh, group would say, so, yeah, we, we've done something similar. And I don't mind working really hard. I'm, I'm not complaining, oh, the tribes, they, they made me work hard. No. A lot of the time it wasn't too bad. Some of the times it was terrible during the big events like the Easter show. I fortunately never got to go to Woodford because that would have, I would not have enjoyed that at all. <laughs> Even in the group's early days, the Chattanooga Times heard from former members that they were working 16 to 18 hour days, six days a week in the very first Yellow Deli, 
One told the publication they worked until we were so tired we could, could not think and were told by elders that any doubts they might be having came from Satan. Matt told me things were pretty similar to the best of his understanding at the New South Wales Yellow Deli too. The Yellow Deli in, up in Katoomba, it's got free labour and by reports, a lot, of, a lot of these young people up there working are, are doing you know, 14, 15, 16 hour days regularly. They don't get paid. There's no superannuation. There's no workers' comp. There, there's no money going back into the government. And then they're competing against all these other businesses who are paying their staff, paying their super, you know, putting money back into the community and trying to compete with this, this church, you know, volunteer group, which is not a volunteer, it, it, it's a business. You know, they don't give out free meals. The following is from an archived version of the FAQ on the 12 Tribes website. Question, if someone leaves your group, can he get his things back or be reimbursed? Answer, not usually. If people convince us that they have the faith to forsake all they possess, as the first believers did in Jerusalem, then their property will be put to use for the benefit of the community. We believe such giving will bring no regret. If later on someone chooses to forsake his covenant, he is free to leave with whatever property he still has in his possession. To the best of our means, we will help such a person leave, but as for his days, months or years of contribution to our life, there is no getting them back. What he appeared to give in good faith, we used in good faith. It is similar to a person leaving a church after years of attendance and contributions. Such a person wouldn't expect to have his freely given tithes and offerings returned. I want to point out here that the situation when someone leaves the 12 tribes is incredibly different from a person's tithes and offerings from a more conventional church. The 12 tribes run multiple profit-making companies, though many avoid tax through religious charity status. And their workers often work incredibly long hours for no salary, six days a week without vacations. They live in communal houses, which may be wonderful in many respects and result in a cooperative fellowship of friends and family. But financially speaking, they're like big share houses. And I know that I personally live in one of those because it reduces my costs of living. And of course, unlike people who leave a church after years of attendance and contributions, when 12 tribes members leave, they have nothing. Back in the early days in Chattanooga, as their numbers grew, the Vine Christian community, also known just as the community, purchased another house to accommodate its members. A second yellow deli was opened in a nearby town, followed soon by five more. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, they had seven delis and a dozen communal houses in the area around Chattanooga. This was also the time of the Jonestown Massacre, in which 918 devotees of Jim Jones's People's Temple died, most of cyanide poisoning. While at the time much of the media reported mass suicide, many were injected against their will, and a third of them were children. This is the event that spawned the phrase, drinking the Kool-Aid, though those who ingested the cyanide orally had actually consumed a product called Flavaid. After hearing of some interest, three couples were sent to the village of Island Pond in Vermont with the message that anyone there was welcome to find out more about this way of life and join them. As this community comprised an older demographic than the Chattanooga community, they owned more businesses, land and houses between them to contribute to the common purpose. More families moved up from Chattanooga to help with setting everything up and the group became known as the Northeast Kingdom Community. In the wake of the Jonestown Massacre in 1978, the 12 Tribes website says that a mounting anti-cult hysteria had been infecting the Chattanooga area and that accusations of child abuse had been levelled against the community. There's no indication as to where these accusations were coming from. The website also mentions multiple instances of kidnappings by deprogrammers. This is definitely a thing that happened during the period and many people involved in this kind of deprogramming practice have disavowed it since. The idea of taking someone against their will and trying to force them, them through a deprogramming regime is quite clearly a breach of human rights. Unless there's a grave danger of harm, such as what happened in Guyana with Jonestown, it's not an acceptable response to losing a loved one to a group you believe is a cult. But the accusations of child abuse don't seem to have come from nothing. 
Whatever the case, the community in Chattanooga decided to move all of its members up to Island Pond to the North Northeast Kingdom community in 1980. Private investigator Galen Kelly found that they made $8 million from property sales, a sum that would be worth over US $30 million in today's money. It was around this time that the community adopted their distinctive dress code, with the men wearing short ponytail and facial hair and women wearing their hair long, clothes in long dresses, skirts or loose pants. As many of us here have likely realised by now in our own lives, running away from your problems doesn't mean your problems don't follow you. By 1984, the group was once again under scrutiny from the authorities around allegations of child abuse. An undated teaching from Jean Spriggs on raising children includes the following. Quote, Unless your son has blue wounds, by this standard, you know what kind of a standard is in you. It is the spirit that hates your son. If one is overly concerned about his son receiving blue marks, you know that he hates his son and hates the word of God. The teaching also gives an example of discipline having its desired result, with Jean speaking of his own discipline of a two-year-old daughter of a devotee he and Marsha had taken with them to fledgling communities in Nova Scotia and France. Here he refers to himself by his given name of Elbert. He tells a story of young Hepzibah coming to understand that she is living for her father and belongs to him, and writes that she was struggling to obey his com command to stop sucking her thumb. Quote, Elbert asked her to stick out her thumb because he was going to cut it off. He took a huge pair of scissors and came toward her. She was terrified, but after receiving her discipline, she willingly stuck out her thumb to be cut off rather than let it cause her to stumble in her obedience to her father. Jean finishes the story by saying that while he didn't cut off her thumb, he wanted Hepzibah to understand that it is better to have your hand cut off now rather than later because he wants her to be saved. Hepzibah, whose real name was Lydia, was eventually re reunited with her father Juan in late 1983. Juan had left the community due to disagreeing with the child discipline teachings after years of devotion to the organisation. He had been searching for, Lyd for Lydia for the better part of two years after her mother had agreed that Jean and Marcia Spriggs could take her as their own child against Juan's wishes. According to a report by the Associated Press, Lydia told her father that she had been beaten a lot with Juan saying, quote, her bottom is really hardened and calloused. While Lydia's mother, Cynthia, along with tribe's elders, Charles Eddie Wiseman and his wife, Mary, were initially detained on suspicion of kidnapping, the authorities ultimately declined to prosecute the case. On the 22nd of June, 1984, 20 communal tri 12 tribes homes in Island Pond were raided by state troopers and social workers and 112 children were removed. The state officials were seeking temporary custody to pursue an investigation into allegations by a dozen former members of child abuse. The raid came after multiple attempts to seek information for the investigation, which resulted in tribes members refusing social workers' entry to the communal homes, members denying named individuals lived there, denying physicians access to children, and claims they didn't know people going by the names recorded on court documents. Judge Frank G. Mahady found the 22 June action to be unlawful and the children were all returned to their homes. This story is often cited outside of the context of the events that led up to it as an example of the overreach of authorities. But it's worth knowing of the numerous prior attempts that hit brick walls. And it's also worth knowing that the judge who ruled the raid unlawful said himself at a previous custody hearing, quote, at all material times, while the children have been residing at that religious community, they have been subjected to frequent and methodical physical abuse by adult members of the community in the form of hours-long whippings with balloon sticks. These beatings result from minor disciplinary infractions. Commissioner of Social and Rehabilitation Services for the Vermont Agency of Human Services, John Burchard, said that the 22 June raid was the culmination of a long, complex and thoughtful process to protect the children. Allegations from former members included those of a four-year-old child being hit 15 to 20 times for pretending a block of wood was a truck, a seven-year-old being stripped naked and spanked to the point of bleeding for asking for more food, and a three-and-a-half-year-old being disciplined until he was bleeding at the neck.
The word spanking in the 12 tribes doesn't mean a smack with an open hand. It means hitting a child with a thin rod set aside specifically for the purpose. And it wasn't only the child's parents encouraged to use the rod. In the now updated FAQ section of the tw tribe's website, the answer to the question, do you spank your children, includes, yes, because we love our children, we do spank them. When they are disobedient or intentionally hurtful to others, we spank them with a small reed light rod, which stings but does not damage. The rod removes guilt from their soul and trains them to do good. We believe many of the problems in youth today are caused by the breakdown of parental authority. Proverbs 13.24 says clearly that he who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. We want to love our children as the scriptures teach. The beliefs underpinning the 12 tribes approach to child discipline can be found in their child training manuals, which will be linked on the website when this episode is released on the podcast for you to read in full. The use of the rod is explicit in these teachings as being a tool that allows adults of all strengths to administer discipline with an equal amount of pain. The manual includes nice things such as never hesitating to show a child affection, always assuring them of your love, and not focusing on the negatives. The use of spanking is the main method of correcting bad behaviour. Quote, you bottom beat, not brow beat. There's a focus on the main point of parenting as being around teaching the child submission and breaking their selfish will. The manual says, train your child to submit willingly to his discipline, make sure he bends over submissively, guilt will not be removed unless he submits willingly. The other major focus is on authority. Quote, authority is the right to command, right for power. Parental authority is authorised by God, not by the state or any other institution. The state does not authorise parents to discipline their children. Parental authority is an inalienable right from the creator. By instilling in children a total submission to their parents as the authority in their lives, the tribes teach that this will set them up to totally submit to God as they get older. Quote, a child who knows that his parents love him and who is obedient to their authority will not find it difficult to submit his will to a loving God. What I hear and read from former 12 Tribes members is that Gene Spriggs taught that he was to be treated as the ultimate authority, as the anointed leader and apostle able to distill the meaning of God's words. In the website FAQ for the question, how is a person saved? The answer includes, this is the road to salvation, pure and simple. A man sent by God, not interested in his own glory, proclaims the very words of Messiah explaining what he requires of those who wish to follow him. The hearer accepts the message, puts his entire trust in the one whose words were preached to him and calls upon him for salvation. Marsha Spriggs, Jean's wife, recalled when the focus on authority started. From the tribe's Awakening Free paper again, quote, Marsha said, I remember Jean starting to teach us about authority. It was very hard for us because everything in society had taught us to reject authority in all its forms. But Jean knew it was important for us as disciples to be able to recognise, submit to and love the spiritual authority. In partnership with the focus on unquestioning submission to authority, there are teachings that require members to distrust their own judgement. Here's a quote from a November 1990 teaching entitled Reasoning. Many people are enslaved by a spirit of reason. They will only come when they are called and go where they are sent when it seems right to them. They will always want to know a reason. If they are under this bondage of reasoning, sooner or later slanderous words will come out of their mouth against authority and there will be no possibility of escape from death. Terms like brainwashing and mind control are sometimes bandied about when it comes to cultic groups. But the main thing to understand about how they tend to operate is an undermining of trust in one's own sense of right and wrong, and a total dependence on instructions from a leadership that is put forward as having all of the answers. In religious groups, this idea will entail the followers very salvation being dependent on this kind of submission. Harsh punishment of children in cultic groups is also incredibly common, especially if over time the leadership has come to find that those being born into the group grow up to reject the teachings and leave. If a child is born pure and without sin, how can it be that they've grown up to rebel unless by a failure of parenting? A focus on obedience, submission and respect of authority is much more likely to result in a devoted member later on in life. Let's have a little change of pace and hear from some of these children. 
We're going to give you a musical interlude from a wedding at one of the 12 tribes communities. By the way, Joe and I have had this song stuck in our heads for weeks now, and I think you'll agree it's quite beautiful. Matthew Klein joined the 12 tribes in March of 1999. Let's hear directly from Matt how this came about. My wife and I, we had two kids. I had a successful business, uh, nice home, couple of cars. We weren't searching for anything in particular, or I wasn't. Um, my wife was suffering, I believe, with postnatal depression, and we had a very sick child as well, uh, which meant we didn't get very much sleep. And my wife was sort of obviously searching for something, so we'd become Christians and we'd, she'd also become organic vegan as well. And despite all of these uh, lifestyle changes, our child still remained sick. And at that point, we weren't vaccinating due to a reaction with one of the vaccinations for my daughter. Uh, so we weren't really welcome in the mainstream hospital system. So our doctor at the time recommended we went to the uh, 12 tribes for some possible respite care where they could help with our baby at night and maybe we could get some sleep, which would have been nice. Matt's wife did end up doing this with their baby and she was immediately taken with the community. She went to the leaders and asked if she could join, but they told her that they'd need to win Matt over first so that the family could join together. So over a period of about seven or eight months, they worked really hard on me with the, the love bombing. So every time I turned up, you know, I got to speak to the cool guys in the group and they were very enthusiastic about me and really, you know, told me what a great asset I am and how good, how many skills I have and if you ever did want to live here, you know, we'd, they'd really appreciate it and they really need people like me and, you know, you want to do God's work and you don't want to be a hypocrite. Yeah, so they, they worked really hard on me to, to get me to join. Matt went to his own church minister with their teachings and his minister said that they were all wrong and he'd talk to him about it later, but he never did. In hindsight, Matt feels that the minister was out of his depth. He should have gone and got help. He didn't. I ended up joining. And look, I don't, I don't blame him, but there were a few, few things there that you know, might have made my life different. And so, yeah, we ended up joining, uh, got baptised... And then the second I was baptised, all the love bombing stopped. <laughs> and I remember standing there going, wow, what do I do now? Matt's parents were concerned about this group he'd become involved with, but they didn't want to speak out against the 12 tribes for fear of losing contact with their son and grandchildren. Tim Elliott told me of some of the difficulties that people with loved ones in the 12 tribes faced if they tried to hold the organisation to account at all. 
In the year 2000, the tribes got a catering con contract for the Sydney Olympic Games. Many of the parents of the members wrote to the organising committee of the Olympic Games and said, how can you give this group any work? How can you let them work at the Olympic Games? They're a highly destructive, high control group. The 12 tribes found out that the parents had written to the Olympic Games organisers and ratted on them and complained about them. So the next thing the parents know is that the kids are just being sent off overseas. So it's terrifying. Your kids and your grandkids are suddenly flown overseas. And often you don't know where they're going. So to speak out against the group is really dangerous. So that's why we found it very hard to find ones who were, who were willing to be really brave and speak out. They didn't want to lose contact with their loved ones, their kids, their grandkids. This was how Matt and his family eventually ended up in Winnipeg, Canada, after Sokog passed on information about his parents' complaints straight back to 12 tribes' leaders. Overseas, Matt found that there was a big difference with the quality of food provided to members. The food in Australia is pretty good, OK? <laughs> I, I certainly was very healthy over here, but once I got to Winnipeg, my wife and I had dental checks before we left to go to America, and halfway through our time in Winnipeg, my wife all of a sudden needed uh, two root canals, a couple of teeth removed, she had abscesses in her mouth, she, she'd lost half her hair, and yeah, she, she wasn't doing well. She was in so much pain, she actually said, I'd prefer to go through childbirth again, which she did without any pain relief, than what she was experiencing in the, in the 12 tribes. And I'm saying to the leaders, we need to get her to a doctor. <laughs> because what you guys have been doing is not working. And they just said, well, we've got no money, you can't go. And, and so you, you, you don't have the option of being able to look after and care for your own family or even your own health. You may have picked up on Matt mentioning how his wife had gone through childbirth without pain relief. Jean Spriggs taught that women must atone for Eve's original sin through childbirth. In the 12 tribes, most births, births occur at home without medical professionals, and women are encouraged to have as many children as possible, with contraceptives not permitted. A former member called Ruth Williams shared that during childbirth, she experienced a condition called placenta previa, where, whereby the placenta blocks the birth canal. She was told to pray, and during labour, she started hemorrhaging and then fell unconscious. She says that she was left on the footpath outside an emergency room and woke up in hospital to find out her baby was stillborn. Tim Elliott also spoke with people who had stories of terrible diets. In America, we spoke to members who were given buckets of old carrots to eat, you know, one chicken between 30 people, boxes of slimy potatoes. And that's because the leadership want to make money off running these cafes. Obviously, no one's going to buy crappy food. So they keep all the really nice food to sell to the public. That's the public-facing side of the group, the Disney version of the 12 tribes, all the beautiful food for their stalls and the cafes. Some of the people we spoke to, you know, their teeth had fallen out, their hair was falling out, their skin was terrible, the diet was so bad. You know, the tribes have a very high rate of stillbirths, a much higher rate than normal of stillbirths, babies being born dead. And that's because it's thought to be one outcome of their, of their really bad diet. Rosemary Illich, who joined with her husband Mark after coming across the 12 tribes at Newtown Festival in 1996, had a stillbirth in 2001 and told Tim Elliott for a Good Weekend article in 2013 that she knew of five others from her time with the tribes in Picton. She puts this down to a lack of access to proper medical care. Matt told me something else about the organic produce that gets such rave reviews on Google and TripAdvisor. Things may have changed, but I know when I was there, we used to sell organic bread, which was 10% organic flour, 90%, you know, 80-20 baker's mix. And they would justify it saying, well, some of the flour is organic, so we'll sell it as organic bread. Even, wow, this spelt bread is so good. How do you get the spelt bread so good? Well, it's 20% spelt, 80% normal flour. That's how you actually <laughs> get it to taste good. And then that was being transported in the back of plumber's trucks and utes. And, you know, like, <laughs> it, was just, it was just horrific. And 
even when I was in there, it's just like, we're deceiving these people. This is not organic. There's nothing, <laughs> there's virtually nothing organic about it. But it's, it's all about the image. It's, it's not about, you know, the reality. I'm going to go back to the child training teachings of the 12 tribes for a moment because there are a couple of important points outside of the rightness or wrongness of spanking in and of itself and they relate to the autonomy of parents and where 12 tribes beliefs break the law. A now deleted entry from the FAQ on the 12 tribes website indicates how the organisation views their belief system if it comes into conflict with the laws of a country. Quote, we now live in the days described in Isaiah 5.20 where good is called evil and evil is called good. Sadly, some countries have passed laws that punish those who obey the scriptures about raising children. We recognise our greater accountability to our creator and we will obey his word and love our children. Do the judges and lawmakers really want us to hate our children? The tribe's position is that if you don't discipline your children as the scriptures have instructed through the interpretations of anointed leader Gene Spriggs, then you won't go to heaven and likely your child won't either. This is quite clearly spelled out in their child training manual. And discipline is not just for disobedience. There are numerous reports from both former members and some who were still members at the time they spoke with journalists saying that something children would be disciplined for with spanking was playing any kind of make-believe or imaginary game. So what if a parent feels that they don't want to use physical punishment on their child? The right to make this decision is essentially taken away from them. In the tribes, only those senior members considered anointed, the prophets, can interpret God's prescription and followers must adhere to their interpretation. In this community, parents are taught that they must discipline their children in this very specific way. There is no option for them not to, quote, Obey those who rule, guide, and lead you. That is a direct command. If they are going to lead you wrong, then we are all in trouble. But you can't doubt your leaders. They know more than you do. Matt Klein told me of his experience with this, which was one of the things that led to him leaving the tribes. My daughter, Tessa, was very, very obedient. She was terrified of being spanked. And so she never once got spanked. And we had leaders telling us, oh, you need to cross her will. You need to make her be disobedient. She needs to receive discipline. And it's like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to trick my child into doing the wrong thing. It's just so I can spank her, like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Another former member who'd been brought up in the tribes told the Denver Post, I was under no circumstances going to beat my kids the way that I was beaten. This man left in his 30s and told journalist Shelley Bradbury, I just could not do it, and you have to do it if you were there. If you're not beating your kids, you're going to be in big trouble. Physical punishment of children is not illegal in many of the countries where this was taking place. This, of course, includes Australia, where corporal punishment is only limited by the word reasonable in most jurisdictions. So whether or not you believe this is right, perhaps in our society that doesn't legislate against it, you think I'm harping on about it a bit too much. But in Germany, where physical punishment of children is against the law, 40 children were removed by the authorities from two Bavarian tribes' communities after a documentary filmmaker obtained footage described as graphic and disturbing in 2013 of 50 separate beatings of children. A subsequent appeal was taken all the way to the European Court of Human Rights, which upheld the decision to remove the children, its judgment citing the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and including that, quote, the proceedings concerned a form of institutionalised violence against minors, which was considered by the applicant parents as an element of the child's upbringing. Consequently, any assistance by the youth office, such as training of the parents, could not have effectively pr protected the children, as corporally disciplining the children was based on their unshakable dogma. Speaking of the UN, Australia has ratified the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child. Yet 12 tribes' children are not permitted to access advanced educational opportunities while they remain a part of the communities. Article 28 at 1C says that signatories shall make higher education accessible to all on the basis of capacity by every appropriate means. This is from the tribe's current awakening free paper. Quote, we love and cherish our children and we teach them at home using a curriculum we are developing ourselves to give them the basic skills they need to read, write and speak effectively, to live together in peace and to fulfil their created purpose. And part of this created purpose appears to include working from a very young age.
allegations of child labour in 2001 led to Estee Lauder and Robert Redford's Sundance catalogue cutting ties with tribes-related businesses, which were subsequently fined $2,000 for child labour law violations. Then as recently as 2018, Inside Edition hooked a former member up with a hidden camera and sent her into a tribe's soap factory. The footage she brought back showed children as young as nine working in the Cambridge, New York factory and resulted in more major brands distancing themselves. A man who left the tribes in 2016 told the Denver Post that he'd worked in a factory from the age of 13 and that his daily schedule involved a mandatory 6am meeting, factory work until 5pm, the evening gathering at 6pm, then back to work from around 7.30 until a 10 or 11pm finish. Don't think this doesn't happen in Australia either. Rose and Mark Illich's son David was put to work labouring from the age of 13 and was working in a bakery in Lidcombe that Tim Elliott reported prepared bread for sale at this very festival from the age of 14. Mark had worked 12, 15 and even 20 hour days at that bakery. Former member Shua Jones told the Times Union that she had regularly worked at the cosmetics factory from the age of eight, that her brother was injured working with a logging crew at 10 and that the tribes, quote, get bolder and more fearless each time they get away with it. She asked a journalist at Pacific Standard magazine, where do our human rights as children begin and their religious rights end? Shua says that she worked full time in the downstairs of a common grounds restaurant in Massachusetts from the age of 14 and was instructed to tell anyone who asked that she was 18. It may seem surprising that honesty is not a core expectation of 12 tribes members. It's actually incredibly common in cultic groups who feel that they answer to a higher power than the laws of the outside world and is key to understanding how a group like this may appear quite different to those who visit and authorities looking in on them to how they are actually interacting behind closed doors. This is important in realising that cultic groups usually present something to those on the outside and who are, to those who have recently joined that is not the same as how they behave with those who are longer term members and highly invested in an organisation. Here's an excerpt from a 19, 1988 Twelve Tribes teaching entitled Lying. Quote, There is a difference between bearing false witness and concealing a matter, not telling the truth, that others have forfeited their right to know because of their hostile and evil attitude toward God. This teaching continues, Sometimes we make a stand with the truth by not revealing the truth or by our answers that are or are not true. Since we respect and honour all authority from God and we know to whom and when to honour it, for we must all stand at the judgment seat of Messiah for what we did in the body. One more quote from the teaching is this, not telling the truth in certain cases is not a lie then. Truth is truth. Not telling the truth to someone who doesn't deserve the truth isn't lying. Telling the truth in certain circumstances may do serious harm to an innocent party. If they knew the truth, it wouldn't always be justice by what they would do with their evil intentions. I happen to agree that lying is, necess is necessary in certain specific circumstances, although I'm incredibly bad at it myself. But absolutely, when someone needs protecting, then the truth may not be the best way. But you need to understand here that serious harm to an innocent party could mean anything that threatens the way of life of 12 tribes members. So telling the truth to child protection authorities, for instance, would not be considered at all necessary. There are numerous stories, which I'm not going to go into today, of the tribes protecting members accused of child sexual abuse rather than reporting them to the authorities. In this teaching, Jean positions the government in line with an enemy in warfare that does not have the right to know the truth. As a former member told the Denver Post, whatever they need to say to keep on doing what they do is what they're going to say. Members can leave, though, you might counter. Yes, that's true. And indeed, that's what Matt did. But he doesn't think that means others can easily make the same decision. These people come out after maybe spending 20 years there. They have no money, they have no super, they have no skills that they can go get a job with. They've, they've, they've got no references, they've got no education. And so then society has to help, you know, try and, and look after them. And, and in Australia, like, when I left, I was really lucky. I went on to a single parent pension and I could survive. That doesn't happen in the States. And quite often, parents will stay because they know if they leave, they may have their children taken off them by, by the state because they're not providing housing for them because they can't provide housing because they've got no money, they've got no references, they've got no friends and family. And so it, it just becomes this real trap, trap for people. 
By leaving, they are also taught that they will forsake their place in the kingdom of heaven. Rose Illich told Tim Elliott that Australian leader Noon would say that people who leave become prostitutes or homosexuals, that you'll suffer sickness, die an early death and go straight to hell. Those who, who, left, who have left are considered more evil than those who never joined since they've actively turned their back on the right way after living it. Tim Elliott told me his further thoughts on this. When you join the tribes, you leave your family behind, you leave your possessions behind, you leave your friends on the outside behind, you leave your job. Every part of joining is that you give it up. And when you are part of the tribes, you, you withdraw from outside society, normal society in air quotes. You aren't allowed to handle money. You don't earn a wage. You don't have a bank account or a mortgage or a phone plan. Uh, if you decide to, after 10 years, to leave, you come out and you have to start your entire life from scratch. You have to get your kids into school. You have to find a place to live. You don't have any money because you haven't been paid a wage. You don't have a bank account. All of that, got nothing. Another really important factor is fear, right? From day one, the kids in the tribes are told that the outside world is inherently evil and that people out there are out to get you and that if you leave, you know, there's common lines, you'll die in a car crash, uh, you'll become gay, you'll turn gay, which is the worst thing ever for them, or you'll be condemned forever to what they call the lake of fire. Perhaps not such a straightforward choice after all. Roger Griffin came across the community through the Yellow Deli in 1973 and joined fully in 1977. Roger had a breadth of knowledge about the Bible from his own upbringing and studies, and within a year he became a household head, which was a head of a communal household with three to four families living there. Roger and his wife had six children together, and none of them had birth certificates. They were all born at home with no prenatal care. He says he is personally aware of more than a dozen families who suffered from stillbirths, which may have been prevented by proper medical care. For some of the time Roger was involved, the teachings around child discipline were worse than those I've mentioned. Roger stayed with the tribes for 20 years and he recalled a period when leadership brought in something called scourging, which involved stripping a child and lashing them from their neck to their feet, sometimes over multiple hours. Several civil cases resulted from this harsh discipline and eventually, due to the trauma and physical damage, Roger says the practice ceased. The point I want to make about this is that it took interventions from the authorities and civil le legal cases to curtail some of the harms of these approaches to child discipline. The more extreme abuses have decreased because of outside concern and because of former members telling their stories. When organisations like this make claims of persecution and when some outsiders frame interventions as overreach, children can be placed in greater danger. A live and let live attitude is all very well, but only up to a point if you care about such things as the rights of the child. As former member Luke Wiseman, son of founding 12 Tribes member Charles Eddie Wiseman, told the Denver Post, we believe in religious rights, but at some point there needs to be a discussion of where does the line come in where religious rights start to psychologically manipulate and abuse children. This is a bigger discussion that needs to be happening. Here's Matthew Klein again. Everyone's horrified at the physical discipline and yes, it's, it's, it's not good and it should not happen. But it's more the psychological effect that it has on them. I've, I've got this one young friend who grew up in there and he's hyper vigilant now because every adult he saw as an enemy, he, he was just waiting to, who am I going to get in trouble off now? Why am I going to get hit? He didn't know why he was getting hit. And so he now can't function in society because he can't trust anyone. He's looking over his shoulder the whole time and he, his, his life is, is not a pleasant one and it's all because of these, you know, narcissistic, you know, control freaks in the 12 tribes 
feel that every child is identical and every child should be hit all the time for any infraction. Over the years, the 12 tribes have also been accused of racism and they put forward the fact that they have black members as proof that this isn't the case. Reading over their materials, you'll find Jean taught that black people were biblically destined to serve white masters in order to become kings in the afterlife. Tribes members do not consider this to be racist, but rather to be scripturally correct. Tim Elliott heard directly from a former member about this aspect of the belief system. African Americans are tolerated in the group, but they must, and this is coming from a guy who we talked to who was half Cherokee, half African American, who joined and left after a while, just severely psychologically damaged. But the attitude there is that, yeah, black people can be a part of the tribes, but they've got to realise that they're subservient, really. Their place is to be subservient. And you know, it's a, it's a testament to the mind control that this group has that, yeah, they do get, you know, African-Americans join. You know, indeed, women join. Tim also told me about the tribe's position on the place of women. They are meant to be completely obedient and subservient to their to their husbands and, indeed, any male in the community. It's, again, it's a bit like, you know, what really reminded me of? It reminded me of Margaret Atwood's book, uh, The Handmaid's Tale, very old fundamentalist, old world view of women's place in society. Marsha Spriggs may be the one exception to this. By the way, in 2008, it came out that Marsha had been involved in numerous extramarital affairs. Jean decided that she should be forgiven, but the revelation caused many people to lose faith in the organisation, since Marsha herself had been instrumental in ousting people for much lesser sins. Some suggest that the exodus prompted even tighter restrictions on members as leadership tried to exercise greater control to stop the numbers dwindling further. Roger Griffin had personally heard Jean preach about slavery and how it was a great opportunity for the black man to come to America. This is an excerpt from a teaching entitled Harm and the Civil Rights Movement, whereby harm is a biblical reference to black people as descendants of Noah's son, who is usually referred to as Ham. Quote, Paul and Yeshua didn't rebuke anyone who had slaves, so it is all right by principle to have slaves. Slavery is the only way for some people to be useful in society. They wouldn't do anything productive without being forced to. The teaching calls Martin Luther King an antichrist and a communist and says the civil rights movement raised the consciousness of the people to rights and the door was open for black people to have rights and then the gays and the women's liberation movement, etc., all the way down to the point where there is a moral breakdown in the basic fabric of families and family structure. When this episode comes out on the podcast feed, all of the teachings and materials that I used in the research will be linked, and I would encourage anyone who is interested in or even sceptical of the things that I'm talking about to read all of them in depth for yourself. Twelve Tribes teachings are meant to be only for baptised members to consume, by the way, while there is an outer doctrine in the form of their free papers and the materials you'll come across in their cafes that is made available to outsiders. It's only thanks to former members sharing the teachings that we have access to this highly protected information. A lot of the articles you'll come across that suggest the media treats the 12 tribes unfairly makes no reference to these teachings. And a teaching called Alien Ant includes, quote, multiculturalism increases murder, crime and prejudice. It goes against the way man is. It places impossible demands on people to love others who are culturally and racially different. This is unnatural, like trying to love sodomites. On the subject of homosexuality, we know that many religions have retrograde beliefs. But Jean Spriggs took things further, saying that homosexual people deserve the death penalty and that homosexuality is demonic. In a teaching called Homosexuals and Lesbians, Jean Spriggs wrote, I wouldn't be hard on homosexuals if God wasn't hard on them. It is they who are detestable, not just their sin. And that homosexuality is a reason for extreme disgust, hatred and loathing in our God. 
A 2007 Ithaca Community News publication cited these beliefs as a reason that upstate New Yorkers should boycott the local mate factor, the 12 Tribes Cafe and Juice Bar in Ithaca. Quote, some confuse the right to free speech and belief to which we are all entitled with a supposed right to not be criticised. This no one has. When an ideology promotes homophobia, misogyny, racism and mistreatment of children, we have an absolute obligation to speak up. Yes, the 12 tribes are for now a small group with fringe beliefs. Every one of us has a real interest in keeping things that way. Please help us boycott Mate Factor. The write-up for this session included a mention of ethical consumption, and I've previously thought long and hard about my visits to Common Ground Bakeries and the Yellow Deli Cafe. The best thing I can think of to do in this situation is to ask a former member for their advice. Here are Matt Klein's thoughts. If you support beating children and abusing women and vulnerable people, then go and give them your money, knowing that money is probably going overseas to feather some bigwig's nest who's living off the labour of everyone else. However, if you don't support those sorts of things, maybe, maybe go to the cafe across the road. Former member D. Lance wrote this in a letter to the Chattanoogan. The proof of what they are and what they do cannot and will never be found by visiting the deli and eating a sandwich. That is just one of the things they do to fund their homes and community. I used to serve those sandwiches with a smile myself. No, the servers don't solicit. They are sweet, wholesome, and the atmosphere is outstanding. None of that is in question. The question is, are you sure you want to support what this group stands for with your dollars? Don't you usually think at least twice before making donations to causes? Be informed, please, please. When Roger Griffin's wife almost died because other leaders told him that she needed to stop taking her thyroid medication and rely on God, Roger's faith in the community was rattled. His wife became incredibly sick and eventually the local community sought Jean's counsel on what to do. She was allowed to take her medication again and Jean later told Roger that he thought she'd only been taking it to lose weight. Roger started asking himself some questions about where God was involved in this situation and why he as an elder needed to seek Jean's permission in the first place for something as crucial as life-saving medication. Matt Klein also had an experience with a life or death situation that required medical care when he was in the tribes. When I had my third child that was born there, uh, at two weeks old, he, he contracted RSV bronchiolitis. And at this stage, fortunately, we are still in contact with our doctor because we'd been in contact with her before we joined. And we rang the doctor and she said, get your son to hospital right now. And I had to go to the leaders to say, can I have the keys to my car? I need to take my son to the hospital. And the th I still remember the three leaders looking at me and said, well... If you want to take your child to the hospital, you can. However, if you have faith that our God can heal your son, we will support you in that decision. So all of a sudden, my child's health was based on my faith. And I had to, it was almost like a test. It's like, are you going to prove to us that you have faith in God, that you will not take your child to the hospital, but you will just pray and God will heal your son? However, they had the out of, we will support you in this decision. We're not telling you to do it. <laughs> we'll just support you in this decision. Uh, I said, uh, give me the car keys, please. I'm off to hospital. And in the waiting room, uh, in the emergency room, he actually stopped breathing twice. And if I hadn't have taken him, he, he would have died. Roger Griffin and his family desperately loved the other families they were living with in the community. But things were coming to a crisis point. Roger asked Jean if he and his family could move to Phoenix, Arizona temporarily to start a way out house. A month living by themselves gave Roger and his family time away from the day-to-day -day demands of the group and physical space of their own again, and this gave them some perspective. A well-timed call from Roger's father to remind him that he was always welcome at his place in Georgia gave them somewhere to go next, so they packed up and left. 
Many former members of harmful groups are driven to speak out as a warning to others. And because they feel responsible for bringing people into something they now believe is not what it purports to be. In the aftermath of their involvement, they feel a need to atone for this in some way. Roger told Stephen Hassan, I loved the 12 tribes when I was there for many years. The vision, the dream, I just took it all hook, line and sinker. And I was able to sell that to a lot of people. And I had a lot of people come into the group from my experience. And when I started realising we weren't who we said we were, we weren't doing what we said we were doing, very early on I just got some urgency with trying to help people to understand what they were getting caught up in. Today, the directory at the back of the Awakening Free Paper on the 12 Tribes website lists Yellow Delis, Mate Factor Cafes and various farms and markets in 15 US states as well as Canada, Brazil, Argentina, England, the Czech Republic, France, Spain, Japan and Australia. New South Wales Police launched an investigation into the 12 Tribes in 2020, which included a search of their property at Bigger, New South Wales, that unearthed the remains of at least one young baby. None of my contacts knows what happened with the progress of this investigation. In March this year, the Sydney Morning Herald reported that detectives had referred the matter to the state coroner. Albert Eugene Spriggs Jr. passed away at the tribe's community in Hiddenite, North Carolina, on the 11th of January 2021 at the age of 83. As the main cause, his death certificate listed respiratory arrest alongside secondary causes of hypoxemic respiratory failure, congestive heart disease and atrial fibrillation. Various sources report this to have been a result of complications relating to COVID, though Jean was heard to say that if anyone in the tribes died of COVID, it would be a result of having disobeyed the commandments. A few of the cultic groups I've looked into became less harmful when their founder passed away. Unfortunately, for the two to 3,000 people still in the 12 tribes, I've also researched groups where things became more controlling. It really depends on who ends up filling the leadership vacuum. And many say that Marsha Spriggs has been the de facto leader for some time now in any case, in spite of the tribe's patriarchal structure. Prior to his death, it seems that Jean had been suffering from dementia for quite some time. Earlier this year, the 12 tribes Picton property, which included the historic Razorback Inn and their Peppercorn Creek farm in southwest Sydney, went up for sale with a price tag totaling around the $6 million mark. Both are now listed as sold. I've heard rumours of several high up members recently leaving the Katoomba community too. In terms of those who have left, even for the luckier ones, there are ongoing impacts. I'm going to finish up this episode with a few words on this from Matthew Klein. As a parent, if you do finally get out of the 12 tribes, the guilt that you have for what you put your children through can sometimes be crushing. And that you don't get over that by, you know, going down to the pub and having a couple of beers or, you know, going and having a few counselling sessions. It becomes a lifelong problem. It's a lifelong uh, sentence you have. Once you've joined the 12 tribes, I was only in there for two years, I still struggle with stuff because of it. sticking around for our long podcast episode about a very heavy topic on a 1st of January but I mean it, I really think it's so important to be informed and I just I'm really impressed. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining me for this episode of Let's Talk About Sects. A big round of applause please for Joe Gould. <laughs> He has a soundtrack album for the podcast, which is available online, Nobody Joins a Cult. Uh, I'll be back with Joe for a Q&A session in a little while, and you can catch us both at the signing tent at 5pm if you'd like to grab a copy of my book or one of the Crooked Fiddle Band's albums. Um, thank you again for sticking it out with me. 